we kind of create more guidelines as we go. That's what we did with the internet. Look what it did for American innovation. Why aren't we doing that with crypto? It's the exact opposite, it's the wrong approach. Um, and it's really unfortunate to see. All right. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Zero X Research. Today is February 13th, and we have an awesome episode lined up with the team over at Gearbox. But before we get into that, as usual, we got a quick little segment of Hot Seat and Cool Throne to kind of talk about the latest market happenings. Uh, we're joined today by two BlockWorks research analysts, Effort Capital and Zero X Pibbles. Um, I guess I can hand it over to you, Effort. I know you got a hot seat you've been dying to talk about. Yeah, the first people in my hot seat are the NFL referees. Um, they ruined not only mine, but I'm sure a bunch of other people had bet on the Eagles win the Super Bowl uh, yesterday. Um, really terrible holding call at the final minutes of the game. Um, even though Bradbury claimed that it was, you know, he did actually hold. I don't think that's the type of uh, call you make uh, with literally the last game of the year on the line. Um, didn't interrupt the, the wide receiver's path to, to the end zone. I thought it was an uncatchable ball. Overall, just terrible call. Yeah, strong agree there, Effort. I uh, can't agree more. My five-leg parlay, I had four legs hit. And then my fifth leg was just Eagles winning the game outright. And it was 25 to win 260. So very upset about that. And then not to mention my Bengals didn't get in. So that was pretty disheartening. It's a rough day for sports ball fans. I got an actual hot seat coming. And that's the, um, the SEC issuing a Wells notice to Paxos over the issuance of BUSD, which is tied to Binance. Um, this sets like a, a pretty interesting precedent for future stable coin legislation. Um, one immediate uh, ripple effect for this was that BNB ripped downwards like 8%, which is tough, you hate to see it. But also what's interesting coming out of this is that Paxos is saying that they are prepared to viciously litigate against this because they do not think that BUSD is an unregistered security. And then further, you have the the New York uh, Department of State or Treasury, something like that. They are also ordering that Paxos stops issuing BUSD by the end of this month. So a lot of stuff heating up in legislation. Yeah, one of the interesting things here was that, uh, you know, it seems that Zero X and GMI have actually flagged this, but it almost seems like uh, this, this Wells notice was specifically related to like a finance bridged version of the asset, right? Because uh, Paxos is, didn't have any issues with their USDP stablecoin. This was strictly a Binance related issue. Um, so there's a couple of things that you, a couple of different directions that you can kind of take that. And one is, you know, maybe this just is more of a coordinated attack against Binance, or maybe two, uh, you know, Binance kind of like took this stable coin and turned it into a yield program or bridge it to another asset. And, you know, that's kind of where the uh, violation was coming through. Uh, so it's, it's a little interesting that Paxos is totally fine with USDP. It's really just this Binance related asset. Um, and, you know, given how we kind of seen Binance's U, uh, U.S. banking partner get turned offline, what was that just last week, maybe two weeks ago, uh, now seeing another Binance related event, it's like almost like there's this targeted attack. And, you know, just broadly looking at things, tensions between uh, U.S. and China are continuing to heat up. And, you know, there might be this uh, effort being made within Washington to say, all right, well, you know, Let's, let's try to favor Coinbase and, and USDC and Circle here and maybe put out an attack towards Binance. Of course, there's no substantive proof of that that's the case, but you know, we're starting to see multiple attacks towards Binance um, coming from US legislators. I think it's crazy. Uh, I think it came out a couple hours ago um, and it's Monday, February 13th, but Circle was actually the one that snitched on Binance or, or BUSD. Uh, it sounds like they actually went to the New York Department of Financial Services told them about uh, just not, not liking what they were seeing with how Paxos has allowed Binance to mint BUSD on the Ethereum blockchain. But Dan, to your point, there are billions of dollars um, on uh, like a Binance peg version of BUSD on the, the Binance smart chain. Um, so it sounds like Circle <laughs> being a major competitor to BUSD and Paxos were the ones that notified the regulatory body. So uh, I think it's especially interesting because there's rumor circulating that circles the next one on the chopping block to get a Wells notice um, given to them, just like we just saw with Paxo. So um, I'd be surprised if that's the case, uh, but really interesting nonetheless that circle was the one to kind of 
open up the can of worms. I feel like it could just be psyops too on the SEC's department trying to make it look like they're, you know, enforcing equally amongst all market participants when in reality they just kind of want to pick the winners and losers of all this. Uh, it's really tough to say, but it just is pretty sketchy to me that, you know, FTX was structured very similar to, similarly to the way that Binance is today and that most of its activity is actually overseas and not based in the U.S. Um, so, yeah, just something to keep an eye on. Not sure how it'll play out, but definitely something we're watching closely. Yeah, and this this situation kind of also rippled into a cool throne as well, right? So USDT Tether stablecoin has kind of been a, like a recipient of this uh, this negative this negative viewpoint towards other stablecoins. Uh, USDT straight traded slightly above peg, which is you know still a little bit rare for stablecoins, just showing a demand for the asset. Uh, three pool on Curve, uh, the decentralized exchange has seen over seven hundred million dollars uh, uh, of volume today. Uh, which is about 70% of their total daily volume that just cracked a billion. Um, and so there's kind of like some winners here, right? Tether and Curve are like, you know, being these these assets that are sitting right in the heart of this, uh, but not really, the negative attention isn't really driven at them. Uh, so Tether is more of an interesting one, right? Because they've had a history of questionable backing and uh, operationally or how they're run. Um, but, you know, again, like the market is kind of viewing them as being the, the stable asset at this moment. So if we look at the three pool reserves, those actually dropped down towards 16%. Um, again, and it was about a negative uh, $40 million outflow from the three pool today of USDT, uh, proving that investors are indeed looking to stable into USDT, uh, which is usually rare because if you follow on-chain activity at all, you know that you know when, when things go south, USDC, Circle Stablecoin, is really where uh, larger funds tend to stable into. Um, so it, it's a little interesting to see that. And again, just curve sitting at the heart of, of stable swaps has been absolutely loving this. Uh, v curve stakers are just raking in the fees today. What is the actual risk here, though? Like, it, it, do you guys see this as a scenario where USDC could actually depeg in a significant way to the downside? Or are you thinking of it more like this is going to be a lawsuit that drags on for one, two years? Uh, or, you know, what are you guys thinking of the scenario? Yeah, my view is definitely the latter there. Um, because what's interesting, especially especially as it relates, relates to the uh, BUSD Paxos thing, is they're still allowing redemptions, right? So if you own BUSD, you can still redeem at one to one. That's not a problem. You just can't mint new assets, uh, which I guess does bring an interesting uh, point in is that you can't really like ARB if it, it trades the upside. So like the trending jokes around BUSD to two dollars, I guess, has some merit to it, especially as liquidity starts to get drained. Um, but I, I imagine this will be like okay if we wake up tomorrow. And there's a Wells notice for USDC. There might be some like short-term turbulence, but the ARB still exists. If it goes, you know, starts trading down towards 99, 98 cents, you can still buy that and redeem for one to one. So I don't. I think it's less of a peg worry, to be honest. But you know, you might be holding some like uh, asset that's now been deemed as a security by the SEC, and like, do you, if you're a larger fund, do you want to be holding that? Like, probably not. So it's, it's just like a bit of regulatory dodgeball in my mind. All right. Well, that uh, kind of leads well into my hot seat for the week. I've got Gary Gensler, obviously the chair of the SEC. Uh, I just don't really understand his his tactics in terms of the way he's going about things in in terms of enforcement rather than thoughtful, you know, legislation. Uh, I mean, to me, it's like the natural market in in crypto decided that the U.S. dollar would be the stable coin of choice for for all of crypto, and for me, that's ultimately good for the US because it keeps dollar dominance in check. Um, it also, you know, creates a new demand source for US treasuries. So it doesn't make any sense for me to be going after all these different stable coins that are essentially cementing the US dollar in this new financial system that we're trying to build. Um, so yeah, uh, he's an easy hot seat this week. Uh, and then that stake video that he put out, like it's so memeable. Like if you guys haven't checked that one out, I, I highly recommend checking that one out. But he's obviously going after Kraken's staking program, and then you know people are you know making conjecture that Coinbase is next, and you know Brian Armstrong's in in DC right now trying to trying to battle that good fight. So Gary Gensler, easy pick for the hot seat this week. You might be getting a uh, unwanted phone call in your near future for putting the SEC commissioner in the hot seat, but uh, <laughs> it's it's tough not to agree there. And I really liked your point about how you know if you just think about uh, like blockchains as emergent economies, we adopted USDC to like onboard new users, uh, and it was very like organic. Nobody forced that to be the decision. Uh, that's just like the global reserve currency, and we wanted that uh, in our ecosystem. And so this is if you like you know, play this out and say blockchain economies continue to grow, you know, as the U.S. government, you would think like, hey, 
you know, let's get the dollar in there. This is a growing economy. Like let's help, you know, facilitate the growth of uh, the U S dollar and, you know, help legitimize and continue the success that the dollar has seen. Uh, so it is, it is pretty interesting to kind of see uh, this, this like negative backlash reaction. And it's hard to really say why, right? Even if it's like, okay, well, all these terrible things just happened. FDX collapse, uh, the Luna collapse was awful. Investors lost a ton of money. It's like, okay, well, you did nothing to prevent that. So now going after like stable coins just seems like a bit weird to me. I agree. Um, and not even just about the stable coin regulation. I think Gensler in general, if you look back in, in the late nineties, uh, early days of, of internet really emerging in the average American uh, person's household, um, the America took a very, or the government, I should say, took a very uh, progressive approach with American internet regulation. They created open regulatory sandbox to allow innovation in America. And that ultimately led to the creation of the major tech giants we, we know of today, kept America at the forefront of innovation uh, and really drove our economy to you know, be what it is today, uh, you know, leading number one in, in almost every single sector possible. Um, that is because of the regulation that they set forth in the 90s. What we're doing right now, assuming, you know, crypto is Internet 2.0 or Web3, whatever you want to call it, we th this type of regulatory approach of enforcement without proper uh, guidance is going to drive an innovation elsewhere. Um, you're already seeing the large players in, in American crypto in, uh, scene really preach this and urge Congress and, and other regulatory bodies to create some kind of rules so that we have safe protection for the average uh, American consumer in, that wants to venture in the crypto space, but allow innovation to breed here, uh, allow it to, f to flourish and prosper. Uh, and over time, as we get about our understanding for what the real value prop is for crypto over the coming years and how it can benefit the average, not even just Americans, but, but persons, uh, people's lives, um, then we kind of create more guidelines as we go. That's what we did with the internet. Look what it did for American innovation. Why aren't we doing that with crypto? It's the exact opposite, it's the wrong approach. Um, and it's really unfortunate to see. Yeah, strong agree there, effort. And just to piggyback off that, I guess there's one silver lining in all of this, which is the religious really banning staking as a service. Uh, so Gensler gets crypto. Like he taught those courses at MIT. You can look them up on YouTube. Like he obviously understands it. So one could take it as. He just doesn't want uh, staking as a service providers to be doing things that they shouldn't be doing with customers' assets. So I, I do get the protection to some degree, and hopefully it promotes at-home staking. Uh, and, and that's really the only positive I can take away from it, but I think it's an important one to, to gather. See, I totally agree with that take, but my issue is it is the way that they went about it, right? Because, you know, Jesse Powell is pretty open about this. He's like, yeah, like, look, we obviously wanted to comply with the, with the law. Like we weren't trying to be uncompliant. The issue is there was no way to like truly register these products uh, with the SEC. So it's like so easy for Gensler to come out and say, Hey, well, you didn't register when in the reality is there was no way to register. And Gensler knows this and he's being malicious about how he's like pursuing these going through lawsuits you know, making these large settlements that flow funds out of these companies to stifle their growth. Like it seems very maliciously uh, coordinated to negatively impact the industry. So uh, while I agree, like that should be ha what happened, uh, the execution of that um, um, just seems like like full of ill intent in my mind. And to take it a step further, Gensler chose to attack Kraken now. Um, right after they did 30% layoffs and they don't really have a ton of cash. If they would have attacked Kraken a year ago, they would have happily fought this. And Jesse Powell even came out and said that. So it really was just going for the neck at a horrible time. We're, we're obviously biased on this podcast, right? Like we're in the crypto industry. We believe, we believe in this. It's very easy from, from our side of the fence go, he's not doing the right thing for our industry that we love so much. But then you have people that are in his own regulatory agency of Hester Pierce coming out saying, he is doing regulatory buy enforcement with no guidance. To Dan, to your point, Kraken couldn't even register their product if they wanted to. Hester came out in uh, Hester Pierce came out in, in a letter on the SEC website that strictly, like, explicitly says that. And she's come out with multiple dissenting letters to the way Gensler has been approaching this entire sector for, I mean, past three three years plus probably at this point. Um, so it really doesn't seem like the enforcement uh, regulation by enforcement is really done anything. It's only hurt consumers. It's only hurt innovation. Uh, it didn't stop the FTXs of the world. Uh, and I don't know why this is going to, you know, I don't, I don't understand how the SEC didn't learn their lessons from, you know, years past. 
it, it's really unfortunate. The one thing that gets me though on the Kraken thing, and I've never used Kraken, so I don't know how many assets they support in the staking program, but four to 24% is what I saw. And I don't know any proof of stake asset that offers 24%. So that does kind of like raise an eyebrow for me and think, you know, what, what were they doing over there? Like, Unless it was like a really like weird long tail asset that you could stake for 24% because that's like what the staking rate was. But like when you look at Coinbase's staking yield, it's like way worse than any other place you can stake. So that, that does raise an eyebrow. But uh, but yeah, that's that's the last point I'd make on that. But effort, I know you got a, a cool throne for the week as well. That kind of ties in. Yeah. Um, yeah. My cool throne today is, is Brian Armstrong. And I, I honestly think like the entire Coinbase executive team, um, they're really like the white knights in this fight right now. They're coming out explicitly like after the whole Kraken uh, crackdown with the regular, with their staking product, they're coming out, uh, their chief legal officer, as well as Brian came out on Twitter and they posted in a blog saying, we will fight this. We have the funds to do it. They're sitting on, you know, four or $5 billion in cash uh, as of the last quarterly um, report. Uh, they have the funds to fight it. They're gonna continue to push American innovation here. They're gonna continue fighting the good fight and I think that's that's noble. Um, there's a lot of, uh, I think, funds and a lot of crypto projects that are considering like leaving um, leaving American borders and maybe pushing their innovation elsewhere and pushing their team development elsewhere. Uh, Coinbase has specifically chosen to be headquartered in America. They're going to continue trying to work with uh, congressmen and women to try to create a, a really good regulatory framework for, for innovation to happen here. Um, I think just this morning, uh, a couple hours ago, Brian today is literally in D.C., meeting with congressmen and women uh, to hash out some type of regulatory framework and just have overall discussion about this because um, someone needs to do it. If, if nobody does it, Gary and the, the entire uh, US government is just gonna steamroll over every single crypto developer and crypto user and, and uh, service provider in America. Um, and I think obviously Coinbase is really, they're standing on the shoulders of giants, but at the same time, they are a giant themselves. They, they've been around in this industry in America for 10 plus years serving us customers um and really they're taking it upon themselves and i'm sure circle as well they're going to be taking it upon themselves to really fight this fight for all american crypto users and i think you know we need them to do that yeah we're gonna to have to have some people in our corner uh, and across various pieces of of the us and the broader regular regulatory landscape uh, so having coinbase in the public company sector is huge for us having tom emmer in the United States House of Representatives is huge for us. Uh, having Hester Pierce sitting in the SEC is huge for us. And we're going to need uh, like those people. They're going to need our support, and we're going to we're going to be like objectively having to rely on them to kind of help push this industry uh, along. Because at the end of the day, there probably needs to be some regulatory framework that outlines what can and can't be done, uh, and that will likely be around the on and off ramps. Uh, so Coinbase again sitting and doing what they're doing is going to be very very good for the this, the growth of this industry. Yeah. And like on top of that, like I always try and zoom out a little bit and think like the average person who is, you know, 20 or even 15 to, to 30 years old is much more bullish on the idea of crypto. And everyone who's in office is, you know, twice as old as that for the most part. So at some point in the future, we will get crypto friendly regulation. And we all know it's pretty much inevitable. You can't stop distributed systems once they're actually decentralized. So I think over the long term, we'll get there. It's just the matter of how long it takes. So uh, on, on to like another topic, cause we're kind of beating this one to a dead horse. We've got a more exciting, cool throne from zero X Pibbles. You want to, you want to share your thoughts there, Pibbs? Yeah. First of all, I guess we'll start as a hot seat because Coinbase and Kraken both tried NFT marketplaces and they were horrible failures, but, uh, tomorrow we get blur and that airdrop is going to be awesome. It's backed by paradigm. It looks like right now looks is trading at a 225 million fully diluted value. OpenSea raised at the top at like a 13 billion value. So um, I'm really hoping that one, the Blur airdrop just like absolutely prints money. It's coming out the gate listed on basically every exchange. But I'm also hoping that Blur kind of acts as almost like an index token where like, okay, if we want to be bullish on NFTs, we can just long blur because we don't really have a proper fitting token for that yet. So with Paradigm behind it, hopefully the the actual token design and mechanics behind it will be 10 of 10. Yeah, I'm really excited for this blur airdrop. I know I've been collecting those boxes, doing all the airdrop tasks to make sure I get that. And 
I'm definitely excited to see what it's worth tomorrow. I just can't decide if I want to dump it because everything's so volatile right now or if I want to hold on to it. But I guess I'll make that choice on a whim tomorrow. I actually hadn't considered that one point though, Pibs, uh, like how we don't really don't have a great way of having a, a you know, liquid token that is a good proxy for uh, NFTs. So that's going to be a really interesting way to kind of play this one going into the future as well. Love that take. So we can head over now to uh, our interview with Gearbox. Um, but first, I want to plug Blockworks Research. You guys should all head over to blockworksresearch.com, go to the research tab and toggle the free research on the top right. Uh, you can check out some of the most compelling research in the space. And you can also follow us on Blockworks uh, Res Twitter. It's Blockworks Res, R-E-S. And then uh, also check out some of our Dune dashboards under the Blockworks research team. They're very good. Dan and uh, Westy have been absolutely killing those. I think one of them is actually trending today with the, the three pool kind of in the limelight. So be sure to check those out. Um, but yeah, on, over on to the interview. All right, we are here with two core contributors to Gearbox. I would love to pass it over to you guys in order to introduce yourselves and then maybe give a little high-level overview of what Gearbox actually is. Thanks for having us, guys. Uh, happy to chat to you. Um, guest introduction from our sales side first, right? So I'm more on the marketing community aspect. Uh, well, in DAOs, it's literally everything apart from code, right? Because biz dev marketing... Uh, is kind of all intertwined, so that's my thing. My name is Ilgis. Uh, I'm responsible for product side, uh, math and risk side, so everything related to, I'd say, calculations, uh, analytics, uh, and also product side, it's on me, yeah. Yeah, so Ilgis is one of the people who keeps the protocol running and safe, and I just shit post, uh, hopefully to get users in. <laughs> I love to hear that. You need a good shit poster on every team. <laughs> Ivan, do you mind giving us a, a high level overview of what Gearbox is for the listeners who aren't familiar? So Gearbox is a two-sided protocol. You can essentially see it serving completely two distinct markets. On one side, it's just liquidity providers who provide liquidity one-sided without any permanent loss, pretty much like a lending uh, action, similar to how you have in an other compound. And they just earn passive APYs. So there is no active management, nothing like that. You just put your assets in and you sleep, that's it. Um, then the other side is where the innovation and the sexy part is. That is the leverage takers who then borrow that liquidity, but on leverage in DeFi. So there, are no key, there is no KYC, no kind of like trust scores, no under collateralization. So leverage takers essentially take that uh, liquidity that is provided by passive uh, providers and then they deploy it across different strategies in DeFi. Later on, it could be even across NFTs or whatnot. So the way it works is how does actually leverage happen in a permissionless way without KYC or any kind of like, I don't know, people come into a house and taking your money back, right? When you don't return it. So the way it works is the capital that you supply uh, and the capital that you borrow, they both end up in a credit account and that's what enables it. A credit account is an isolated smart contract that essentially has the both the borrowed funds and your funds in it. So you operate through that. See it like a leveraged DeFi wallet, essentially, that has liquidation parameters and all the assets in it. So you interact with the DeFi protocols, let's say margin training on Uniswap, leverage farming on Curve, leverage farming on Convex, and later on doing a bunch more other stuff with leverage. You just do it through that larger credit account, but it still belongs to you, essentially. You just can't take the money easily out. Um, why? Well, because otherwise, if you just come in and you would say you put 10 ETH and you borrow 90, you would just take it, right? Of course, free money. Why not? But that's the thing. The credit account has some rules in it, whereas you cannot just trade into absolutely any shit coin. So there is like collateral onboarding similar to lending protocols. That is for the sake that you cannot just, let's say, siphon the money out by creating an ERC-20 yourself, putting on Uniswap and buying it, right? That's pretty much like that would be a very easy way to steal the funds. And the second part is the uh, allowed contracts. So allowed assets and allowed contracts. And that means you can only interact with the things that are essentially enabled by the DAO, by the protocol. You can really see it similar to collateral onboarding. If you wrap it together into a bigger picture, it's like a leveraged DeFi wallet or leveraged NFT wallet. The point is it's a smart contract wallet to an extent that you use when you have more funds in it due to leverage. And then you go and interact with all these other platforms that you already used to and love like that. But you do it, of course, without KYC permissions or, um, and of course, with more capital in it. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. So if I was just to like summarize that back to you, just make sure, you know, we've, we've got this a hold of this. So basically there's a two-sided protocol where passive lenders can supply funds that 
Gearbox borrowers can pull from. Uh, and borrowers leverage uh, things called credit accounts, which are like smart contracts that essentially can create the leverage from the LP positions and take that capital and supply it into governance approved strategies uh, into other DeFi protocols. And so is, is, that, is that a good summary there? Uh, except on the last point, I would just reiterate that uh, these are not like, so what we are used to in DeFi when this happens or with leverage, right, that there are some pre-approved strategies per se, and those strategies function as like, I don't know, vaults, right, or smart contracts that essentially have the rules that allow you to farm and make money. That isn't the case here. So here you are given more capital and you are given some restrictions that you have to work within for security purposes. But apart from that, you choose how it happens. So let's say you can go cross collateral, you put in some ETH, you borrow stables instead, uh, and then you put it, let's say, into some, let's say it's given a concrete example. Um, let's say you want to leverage farm LSDs, right? The latest hot topic stuff, the liquid staking derivatives. You can put in ETH as um, your collateral, um, then you borrow more ETH, and then you put a lot of that into STH. Or what you, more you can do is usually that's as much as it goes, right? That is already accessible in AVA and E mode and other lending protocols. There is nothing too fancy here. What you can do you the gearbox, what you can do is you take that STEs, then later, and you go to con to curve to supply liquidity there, and then stake on convex. So it allows you to go further. And why that is cool is because the yield that you get is essentially it's exogenous. So it comes from other protocols. While if you execute similar strategies, let's say on Aave, which doesn't great, but the thing is that there you cannot go to other protocols. You essentially arbitrage within the protocol, right? ETH has a supply and borrow rate. ST ETH has supply and borrow rate. You essentially put one, borrow the other, sell, put it back, right? You loop it. Here it's not looping. Here is you get, so on lending protocols, you loop it around. That's how you get leverage and more APY. With Gearbox, you first get just a bunch of capital and then you just go to whatever protocols that you already used to. So that's the big distinction that you decide how and where you deploy capital, how the risk score parameters changes and everything like that. It's not a predefined strategy. Awesome. No, that's definitely an interesting rendition on what you know we currently see that's available in the market. And I think is a, a lot of the reason why Gearbox has, has seen some early success already surpassing 100 million in TVL. Uh, we see users actually deploying across various strategies. And it looks like one of the more popular ones is the SUSD uh, curve convex position. Um, does that is that's probably generated just granted really the yield that you can pull there, I think was around 30% APY. Um, is that, is that the most popular strategy today? And you know, if so, like what are the other popular strategies that users are deploying mm -hmm. to? Yep. So the thing is that as you know, strategies always change in their APYs, right? Sometimes when a new stable coin comes to curve, they incentivize a lot. And then after some point when they have enough liquidity, like, ah, we had enough. And then it always switches, right? So rebalancing is a thing of itself. Actually, when Gearbox V2 launched, I think the first week of November, the most popular was, I believe, LUSD. That's when it was printing a lot. Uh, then LUSD, they stopped issuing that much rewards and voting for it. So there has been less APY. I think people transitioned to GUSD after that. After GUSD started having some risks, people just decided not to be, not to be having fun with it anymore. And now for the past couple of weeks, it's SUSD. But it can, of course, always change depending on what other... Basically, it's a competition within the credit accounts themselves. Some people rebalance actively. Some people don't rebalance actively. Some take a uh, cross-collateral position. So essentially, they even end like a short or a loan while farming. Some just do it with correlated debt, like ETH to ETH or stable to stable. An interesting point to point out is, let's say, one could wonder, why do leverage with Gearbox, right? Okay, no permissions, no KYC, kind of good, but what is the actual UX improvement in that? It, because it allows you to do more with your leverage. So for instance, if you short BTC or ETH on, let's say, Binance, uh, you can like, it, it's efficient, right? It's good, it's fast, it's good pricing. Fees are not too huge. But what happens is you only just go short or long. And the only thing you can do is just to maintain your liquidation ratio or like top up collateral. That's it, right? You, you can't do much. With Gearbox, what happens is when you borrow, let's say you want to go short ETH. That means you borrow more ETH on leverage. And then you sell it within your leveraged wallet into USDC. What it means is you leverage sold Ethereum, so you went short. But that USDC you still have on, at your disposal. That USDC you later on, let's say you bring to Curve Convex or Wyorm, and then you are farming and you're making APY. So that means the APY from that position of USDC is essentially either making money or paying back for the borrow rate that you're paying on the ETH that you borrowed. 
So that way you kind of like have a self-repaying short or a short that makes money. So it's like double, double the money if you do it right. That's interesting. Now, I, I guess when I'm thinking of it from my perspective, I, I think I'd be looking at the, the APYs on the screen and constantly trying to switch to like the best strategy available, like given that they're all variable rates. So are the fees associated with closing and open, opening positions pretty high to disincentivize that kind of behavior? Like, are you going to end up shooting yourself in the foot or how, how do the fees look? Yeah, well, depends really per case, right? It depends how much a position APY has dropped at your in compared to the one you're entering and how long you expect it to be the case. Because even those that just do it on curve, like rebalancing back from the day curve launched, some do it successfully, some end up not figuring it out well. Because entering a curve position is a trade of itself, right? Especially with LUSD like it was. You can enter at 15% APY, but if you're buying LUSD essentially, because if you enter a farm, use binding to the asset, right? At least partially, either 25% or 33 or 50, depending on what the pool is. So if you buy it at a high mark and then the peg comes back, you lost money, even though you're making APY. So that's one thing to point out. Uh, that is not exclusive in Gearbox. They're just anywhere if you do it without leverage. With leverage, what you have to take into account is, let's say you're trading 100K USD worth of BTC into ETH. So let's say USDC into ETH. Your slippage usually is very tiny, right? Because these pools are very... Uh, they're very uh, tight range, so it's fine. But if you do it on leverage, you let's say you have your own t- capital 10K and you're trading a 100K position, your slippage would be like what? Let's say 0.1 max, right? 0.05. So like, it'll just correct me here, 500 bucks, right? You essentially would lose. So you're using 500 bucks on a 100K trade, which is fine. It's not that much. But that loss is not applied to the entire position. It's applied essentially to you. Because you cannot be losing lender's capital, right? You're losing only your own. Slippage is your thing. So that way, if you trade way too much like this, uh, without realizing profit, you could end up with a slippage eating into your position. But that's in general anywhere. Really. Like if you trade with futures, you also would kind of end up in the same situation. Yeah. So switching depends per case. We see active switchers. We see less active ones. Actually, a lot of active, to be honest. And so far, they're doing it. That means they're either liking to lose money, which could be the case, or they actually make it. Okay, that, that that's super helpful. In, in terms of liquidations, obviously liquidations are going to be a key part of this system. How do those work? And uh, I, I assume oracles play a role in this, likely Chainlink oracles. And what are the fees associated with it? Can you just kind of give us a, a full like overview of how liquidations operate? Yeah, sure. So uh, as I haven't explained, overall position always over collateralized rest. So uh, actually, uh, in terms of liquidations, there is no need to external capital to liquidate. You can just work with capital uh, that holding on your on credit a credit account, and after that, you can swap it back to underlying asset, uh, pay back the debt, uh, pay assets that left to the original user, and get some uh, rewards uh, like liquidation premium to yourself as liquidator. So. Uh, that's like capital, very capital efficient way of liquidations. And in terms of, in terms of uh, understanding when and how liquidation should happen, uh, each credit account has uh, a special formula uh, and calculates its health factor of position that actually represents the over collateralization of uh, your credit account. So it's like a formula when some liquidation threshold which actually represents uh, loan to value multiplied on the number of assets you hold and the price uh, price from price oracle. We now use uh, Chainlink price oracle, so of course, like it's source of data. And uh, after that, uh, we aggregated this number and divided on the overall amount of debt that you have. And this health factor should be uh, upper than one. And if it's goal to the one or below one, then anybody can liquidate your position, get uh, some liquidation premium, pay some liquidation fee uh, to the DAO, and yeah, and so like paying back the debt and uh, closing position of the user. And so I noticed that you know they still have like the 100k minimum deposit on the credit accounts, and uh, I think some a portion of that has to do with the fact that larger uh, liquidations are more attractive and can be executed easier. Can you just speak to why that's the case? 
Yeah, in terms of credit account, uh, you can now hold different uh, position inside. Yeah, so for example, it could be uh, different deposit into convex for different curve pools, and unwrapping the position could cost a lot of money, especially when, uh, when for example, price drops and gas prices peaks in such uh, cases usually. So uh, we should take into account all of this uh, volatility of gas fees. Uh, so, and uh, take into account that unwrapping such kind of position when you can hold up to, I don't know, five, six convex positions, that could be very costly. Yeah. So in terms of, uh, to be sure that this, uh, will be safe, we should put some, we, we actually can work with two numbers. First one is, uh, the liquidation premium amount, uh, or total uh, balance sheet of the credit accounts. So of course, if like, if for example, if, if total balance sheet on the credit account is 1 million, we can charge small fee. Yeah. So, and in that case, if it's, this is a small fee, we can give more leverage to the user. So in terms of um, understanding best parameter here, we like, uh, take into account that we want to give some good amount of leverage for our users because like Diggins want to extend. Uh, so that actually limits our uh, possibilities, our, 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 uh, our possibilities to put different uh, limits for liquidation premium and amount of money that you should hold on your credit account. Yeah, I know. As a frequent user of the Curve and Convex ecosystem, I know how those gas fees can stack up all too well. Um, but speaking further to that, does it make, uh, how, how are you thinking about deploying on L2s really? Uh, I feel like that could kind of alleviate some of that stress and potentially, uh, create an environment where you could lower that, that borrowing, uh, uh, limit. So the thing is that it doesn't, uh, while well, gearbox itself for now has high limits, minimum limits, um, even if they don't drop, there are already two protocols like Mellow and Brahma that work on making vaults for these strategies. So those could be accessible to those traders or farmers who don't have that much capital. So it's fine that we are not servicing the end user ourselves as long as they have the option to go and still become our user because like then we are a protocol to protocol product, which is sometimes easier to manage than having every user individually. Um, and another point, actually, what we've seen since the literally the second day of launch is the utilization has been 70% and higher at all times, up to 85 in a few days. And it can never be 100 because the utilization buffer formula is same as an other, essentially, and in Legend Protocol. So as soon as it reaches 85, it's like hockey stick to the moon. Uh, not, not the right moon, the, the bad moon for borrowers, yeah. So in that case, like we haven't seen shortage of users on this. So we have, I guess we could say we organically has hit PMF on that side, somewhat fostered and bootstrap, but still not an issue. More of an issue is the passive side, but that's mostly coming from the credit risk and the lending markets, the fiasco of FTX and other scammers last year. So yeah, that's just another, this is a sub product of what happened recently, but it will not stay forever like that. Yeah. As for L2s, it'll get uh, over to you. Sorry to interrupt you there. No, no, go ahead. Okay. Uh, let me start in. Uh, so. For L2s, definitely, uh, gas fees are much less of a concern. Uh, the concern there is twofold. First of all, what even strategies and farms to enable? Because let's say even if we have curable convex, they are like, what are they? Before they used to be $4 billion protocols. I think now like one, right? So even if we have to be really huge to even matter and be like kind of bad in that equation, meaning that if a pool has 100M and gearbox traders are like 30% of that, that's totally fine, right? That's absolutely okay. Now, if you go to L2s and you have the same things and Gearbox ends up as one of the largest users on it, it's more risky because like essentially all the TVL is coming from the leverage side, right? So imagine if that was in an altcoin, so then you can have some manipulation to an extent. Maybe not. It's just, I'm not a math guy, right? Don't, don't shoot me. Um, so that's one. Which actually strategies to enable what will even be interesting to people? Because if you look at the TVL of like top protocols and Optimus, Garbage from Polygon, it's good, but like top three are good and the rest are like around 30, 20 M. So not even sure how much it can service. Still, we will go. We will go there. It's fine. Not complaining about that. The bigger portion is, the bigger question is how to enable more assets, both on Ethereum and on L2s and sidechain, whatnot, without risk and security that much. So at that point, actually, it's the first time we're speaking of it. Developers are coming up with the model where assets can have caps. So assets have limits. Meaning we can even whitelist a penis coin 
if you put a cap that only 500k of capital can enter penis coin, then it's fine, right? Because like that's not that much exposure. So in that case, we could be adding more medium or long tail without having much risk. Uh, so that would be a solution to that. Yeah. If the fee in terms of liquidations isn't high enough, then the protocol could be you know left with bad debt. Um, and you know there needs to be ample liquidity for whatever assets being liquidated. You know it's possible someone makes an error on the team or in the DAO decision making process. So what happens if the protocol is left with bad debt? What what's the recourse there? Um, the usual, honestly, like it depends on the size of bad debt, right? Uh, some protocols like Aave have pioneered that back in the days. I mean, they pioneered or not, but they're known for their staked Aave model that is still lives to this day. But correct me if I'm wrong, have they ever activated it actually? Like even after CRV thing with the Mango guy, I don't think they actually used it, right? Because like bad debt is either like small enough and you can ignore it because it earns back or it will never shrink to that size. Or bad debt is slow, large that any no staking module would really help it. So depends really on the size. The small size, maybe the treasury can cover a vote for it. To a medium size, maybe tokens can be used from the DAO in investing for it to not cause the market pressure. And then like as a remedy to those who were affected, right? If let's say full TV will get drained, um, as it happened before, protocols have just nothing to do with that, right? Like you, you, you can't like make money out of thin air. Well, some do, but unless you're a stablecoin protocol, you, you can't pull money out of thin air. Yeah, or to mention that we have some insurance funds working uh, inside our protocol uh, because like protocol is designed so that it uh, uh, takes all fees in diesel tokens. Diesel tokens is our LP tokens. Uh, so these diesel tokens actually uh, hold it on our uh, treasury and if for example uh, liquidations happens not on time and there is like, some losses uh, protocol just burns uh, some lp tokens that uh, laying on the treasury so it's like self-insurance uh, and self-pay this bad debt of course it's not uh, work for like uh, large bad debt as ivan said because it, this is some something else i guess but for sm small cases that could work automatically and didn't take any action from community or somebody else in terms of liquid staking derivatives i know you mentioned this a little bit but i would expect that to be one of the most popular strategies can you kind of explain the mechanisms of what that looks like how it works and what kind of yield you can actually expect so so far liquid staking derivatives have mostly been about if being a chip like on our and compound i think if borrow rate has historically been like I think it was even as low as 0.3% uh, all the way up to two and now even a bit higher. Uh, you just take cheaper ETH, you put it into STH or some other liquid staking derivative that's available on the protocol you are doing it, and then you just loop it, right? Um, in Gearbox, it's a bit of a different thing. You don't loop it. You first just take a bunch of ETH, and then you put it into liquid staking derivative. But the end case is kind of the same, whether it's other E-mode or Gearbox or Euler or something else. With Gearbox, you can, although... Later on, put it into Curve and into Convex or into Curve and then into Wire. And so there are different other strategies with it, but which were actually more profitable. So while SDH peg was more of a concern back in the days, Lido DAO printed more into the uh, liquidity pool, right? To issue more rewards. Now for the past couple of months, uh, the peg has been very good, like almost one all the time. So instead they're printing or not even printing into the normal staking because they want to ensure the TBL growth, right? So that's why the most popular strategy that they said just to pile up a bunch of ETH at the borrow rate that is cheap into STH. That's a uh, very dummy strategy. Now, that actually might be coming to an end for all lending protocols, because what happens is there isn't much inflow of new Ethereum into lending protocols. So you lose that cheap capital to borrow from. And you can even say there could be an argument that Ethereum borrow rate, like pure Ethereum borrow rate, will converge with the staking rate, not one-to-one, -one, but like close enough violent in protocols. So in that case, LSD narrative farming might even die out because you will have you will have a cap on how much amount can be extracted. Unless, I don't know, Joe Lubin wakes up and puts a fuckload of ETH into its passive side. I mean, that's, but yeah, you run off the passive supply of that. Speaking of that, actually, uh, that is why Maker only learned of it today, to be honest. Uh, Maker is doing the, what does they call it? Ether die, ether die thingy, where they split it. So they just want to maintain that supply of idle ETH that is cheap to borrow. Because honestly, cheap borrowed ETH has been the source of strategies for InstaDub for almost a year at this point. 
has been the source of yields for Aave, for Euler, for Gearbox, like, because that is the most organic DeFi native on-chain yield, right? While stables have actually been underperforming because, uh, well, yeah, there, there wasn't much demand for those as volatility has died uh, in the last few months. Yeah. So that is what, that's my concern with all these, or more like a perspective where it could go. But also people are saying that then, I don't know, the risk score of LSDs, the risk adjusted return of LSDs will never be as much as Ethereum, uh, normal yield on lending. So like it will always be some spread, but when the spread is too tiny, people don't don't care, right? So then you might end up not having to see the pie grow. Ilgis, what's your perspective on LSDs? Yeah, I guess like spread spread will be very tiny, and actually, um, I don't I don't I don't I don't think that uh, leveraging will make a sense for such kind of stuff uh, after Shanghai release. But for now, it's like a huge narrative uh, still, and I guess one of the best opportunity to uh, get yield. Yield will likely remain in LSDs because they will be synthetics coming up on that front, like what Maker is trying to do, and what Frax I think it's also trying to do with their non-staked version of Frax ETH. So you could see that happen, but that means the yield will be there due to increased risks. But if those risks are printed by the protocols that are the largest in that narrative in the first place, then you can say it's not even that much additional risk, to be honest, yeah. Actually, funny thing, because when we were discussing LSDs and the fact that ETH uh, pure supply is running out and not really coming to lending protocols anymore, uh, Ilgis even came up with an idea of like synthetic ETH splitting it into two. And then we were like, okay, maybe we should even propose it to the DAO. And then today we see the thread about Maker doing ETH or DAI, which actually has been in the work for some time. So either Ilgis is a scammer and he came up with an idea that he read two months ago, or he's a genius who just thought the same way. <laughs> Ilgis, <laughs> going to confess now what it was? I don't know. I just think that everybody's talking about it. So it's like same ideas come to different points. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting to see because like currently you see Aave listing all these LSDs uh, through their uh, like Ethereum V3 um, that they recently launched on uh, mainnet. So it is kind of interesting to consider the fact that ETH, uh, like raw ETH will not be cheap to borrow forever because that supply is kind of gradually moving towards uh, being staked and therefore there's less less deep of a supply. Uh, so the demand kind of catches up. And I think I kind of agree that over the long term, you will see uh, the, the ETH borrow rate kind of converge towards the ETH staking rate, which is a pretty interesting thing uh, to think about, especially when you're adding leverage into the equation. Uh, but to keep this, keep it, keep it rolling here. You know, last month Gearbox announced V two point one, uh, and one of the interesting things that was tied to that is Gearbots, which gives uh, credit account users the ability to have some automation. Uh, how will Gearbots kind of change the user experience for credit account users? So one of the problems. Uh... As we, as we can see, uh, the problems that faced uh, credit account users is that uh, like leverage is a risk, right? And of course, you want a different, uh, different tools to actually cre do this risk lesser, yeah? And in the success, for example, you have different stop loss orders and so on and so on. So you can manage this risk, you can put stop loss, and to be sure that even you are not online, that your position will be closed and you don't lose all your money. Uh, on chain, it's a little bit trickier to do such kind of stuff. And that's how we came to idea with these gearbots where uh, you can add some external uh, predefined strategies to your credit account and implement different logic. For example, stop loss order for your leverage position. Uh, which actually can work pretty similar how it works on sex access. If, for example, the pair happens, it could automatically uh, using some automation protocol like Gelato, for example, uh, or Keeper Network can be un unwrapped, underlying, and okay, you can be sure that everything will be good with your position. You don't be liquidated. Or, for example, you can do uh, different, for example, DCA strategy. Yeah? It's could be something interesting for you if you want a long sum asset and doing one big order on chain it's not very good idea uh not always uh, so maybe you want to just increase your position instantly and of course you can't send every hour 
transaction by man manually. Yeah, it's like not convenient. And here you can in, uh, connect your credit account with some external bot, uh, which implements this DCA strategy. And again, with some automation protocol, it can work everything you want uh, for you. And in terms of how it works inside, uh, actually, like we as protocol, just check that uh, all operations that happens with these uh, external bots, they are safe, so that uh, there is no like uh, losing funds. Uh, you can put some uh, uh, some parameters. How much, for example, uh, slippage you can have on order with gearbots and so on. So we can manage uh, some parameters that. Uh, available, what's, what kind of options available for uh, both smart contract and it actually uh, to be sure that uh, strategy implementing these bots actually works what you want and can do anything in besides that. Now, when you say that there's like an external factor to this, is that requires some off-chain off computation that is then pushed on-chain and uh, executes the automated strategy, or is everything actually happening on-chain? Uh, now, what we actually what what we are thinking about that this strategy should be on-chain, so it's like sim more, more, more simple strategies, not very very complicated ones. Uh, so. We think first use cases will be, as I said, some like stop losses, some simple, I don't, I don't know, strategies that help you to manage your accounts while you are sleeping and, and so on. Yeah, so it's like the same stuff that you have already as a trader, the same tools you use stop loss limit order, but instead it's on chain, because if you do it off chain, you either like kind of have to trust like gearbox service or the interface, right? That you shouldn't be, you shouldn't be doing that. Or I don't know, you run your own bot and then you give it private key yourself and then it tries to trade for you while you sleep. Not a good idea either. I mean, here people will be able to see, I guess, right, August, where your stop losses and whatnot. But in Legend Protocols, people can see your liquidation price anyway. So like, what's the, what's the difference here? It only becomes an issue. Like, remember how we were all watching the other liquidation thing? I was like looking to buy, what was the shit at? 889? Eight, eight? Yeah, I think something like that. 888, they, yeah, that's why all the, especially the Chinese community were like, yeah, it's never going below. That shit didn't go below. I think it even dropped to health factor of like, uh, literally dropped to one, but there wasn't enough liquidity to liquidate it with profits in that block. And next block immediately, it was like higher. I could be wrong, but yeah, that's, I'm just making an example that the fact that it's on chain and people know that your account will be liquidated, then that's okay. It's still small. If big gearbox becomes 10 billion, well, yeah, then it's an issue, but I'm pretty sure the solution will pop up for that. Yeah, no, that's super interesting as well. And so now it was just a day or a half, maybe two days ago, uh, Ivan, you actually authored a post r related to the special LP boost program. And it's really kind of focusing on like, okay, how do we scale the TVL here? How do we get to that $1 billion mark? Uh, and then even at one point, you said the main point, need passive liquidity. So how do you think about attracting that in? Uh, and why is it so important to the protocol? Yeah, so good, good question. Actually, wanted to focus on that to be honest so thanks for that um as i mentioned the utilization has been really high since the second day of launch without any incentives or anything like that so that's really organic and ninjas meaning the leverage takers and credit account side they just want more and more liquidity to utilize they have the alpha they know how to make money they are ready to pay them above the market but the issue is that uh, well first when we launched it was the ftx fiasco shit and everything like that the market wasn't feeling that well then it was the gbtc right the berry having a big week uh and uh, <laughs> sorry um so yeah we understand that's why a lot of liquidity just left or just got scared so i think is that liquidity has always a breaking point right let's say if i tell you you can have rate on usdc on ave at 10 percent, you will go right but if i tell you there is 10 percent on usdc in a newer protocol you'll be like ah eh, i don't know if it will stay for long enough right so the breaking point right now might just be way too high because you have to kind of compete with other protocols with the with the real world yield and with the fact that people are just scared for example i've been sitting on a huge usdc bag myself for the entire year didn't do shit with it uh i was just scared to shit i was like damn where am i gonna put it i put it in gearbox for some time but later on i was like mm, having all the eggs in my own basket might not be that smart it, it was in hindsight it was but i'm a shit trader yeah so how to think about it 
Um, yeah, so that issue that I just explained, that is just something that will go away after a certain point, like when the market either picks up or the fear goes away. So then naturally people will be more okay with even lower yields at the same risk level. Now they're just scared. Another thing is we were trying to do the institutional route for some time, but honestly, institutional, first of all, they take a fuckload of approval, uh, sorry, uh, to actually get the permission to put capital in. So that's one issue. It takes ages. Second, because of that stuff that happened, many of them just stopped doing it in the first place. Like they just like, yeah, we closed that thing. We closed that thing. We closed that thing. So for TVL, for Gearbox, mostly has been DGEMs. Honestly, one night I just get the DM, like, hey, I just put 10 million in the protocol. I'm like, good, good, good for us. Good for you. So just trying to get more marketing, more community, more DAO to DAO stuff. There is really now no approach because we don't know what approach could be like. If you have suggestions, happy to listen, give a referral and stuff like that, you know, but that is, has been the uh, growth bottleneck. Um, maybe getting more passive assets on the passive side is one, but long term, how we think of it also is uh, there will be institu not institutions and protocols that will happily supply liquidity at a lower rate. Like retail might not be right or institutions might not be willing to take a 5% rate. If you tell 5% to die and you say we have very much low risk, they'll be like, that's 5x of our DSR. They'll be happy to. We just need to grow to enough reputation level to go to co to go to uh, Curve, uh, CRV, USD, to go to Maker, to go to Frax. At that point, actually, Frax already approved the ammo for Gearbox, but it starts only at 2M, but they can scale it up. So stablecoin issuers, for example, they will always be ready to accept a low rate compared to what the market offers in general. Uh, just a bit too soon for us on that note. But already see it working. For instance, what today's Spark protocol that maker spin off, right? Not a spin off, more like a sub DAO initiative. They're kind of making their own lending protocol. Uh, but then they have access to the D3 module, right? Which is, they're saying, yeah, we'll have two million, 200 million liquidity at 1% rate to kickstart an OP side. That's like, there's no adoption of the protocol happening just due to the fact that they're close to maker and they can get such rates. I, don't, I wouldn't call it fair, but who cares about fair? It's uh, It makes sense for maker as well. Like Otherwise, they either have it sitting in there, right? Or they give it to somebody to have more risk. Question is, where is enough risk? Yeah, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, do you mind explaining kind of the governance process as it relates to gear? I mean, right now, that's kind of the main utility of the gear token. So how is that process evolving? What have you learned from, you know, the first three or four months of, of DAO governance and how do you plan to push it forward? Good question. So we cannot like peacock on the governance topic too much because for now it's just snapshot and multi-sig execution. Like we haven't had any, so that's like meh, like it's lame, right? But we haven't had any deviation from the rules, quorums or procedures. So what was set up, even though it was not fully on chain, has worked fully to the last rule of the law or like of the letter, right? So that's at least commendable to an extent. Um, we want to have on-chain governance, obviously, as soon as possible. But while the PMF is not there and the product is not fully showing that it's like it's good and stable, having governance is like, I don't know, trying to, as I mean yesterday, trying to put a dark mode on your interface while you have 10 years. So you're like, oh my God, we spent a month making dark mode. Like, look at this, like, good for you, good for you. Of course, not the same level of comparison because one is more security related, but you get what I mean, yeah. So uh, the multi-six though, they were enacted by the token holders from the very first day. So everything has functioned properly. Just that, uh, yeah, it was just snapshot delegation really. Um, there are a bunch of interesting governance models, uh, more like, there is one thing though. If you have a bit of a leeway of how you work and you have the snapshot plus multi-six model, you can experiment a bit more because once you're fully on chain, you, you can't really experiment much, right? What I mean is that now what we what we are voting for is the OBRA model. Like I forget how the abbreviation is, um, how the abbreviation goes. But point is, usually governance is like they have either working groups, right, and they get voted on or they rotate, or these councils or committees that also get rotated and get voted periodically. That is more like element model, synthetics model, wire model, close enough to an extent. It's good on chain. It makes sense. What we are doing is we are doing essentially that proposal that Peter from 1KX proposed to Gnosis Safe DAO. That is, you don't have working groups. You don't have like teams. You have just initiatives. So the DAO votes for the big goals. Let's say we want more TBL. We want nice interface. We want something else. And then different teams come in and essentially compete with their proposals to execute each different strategy that the DAO voted for. 
And then that just happens. You don't need to have synchronicity. It's also better conceptually, legally speaking, because you really don't have any overseer. Like the DAO just voted, gave budget, and that's it. Like, do your thing. It's more like a grant, everything turning into grants. It could be hard to do though on chain because uh, they're councils and committees are easier to do on chain, right? You vote for something, you have the signers, then the vote has quorum kind of easier. It rotates. Here might be a bit harder, but maybe even easier because DAO just votes for the budgets, right? Then it just sends the money and that's it. There is nothing else after that. So it could be even easier, yeah. But that's so far on the governance front. We want to see it end of this year, hopefully, unless our devs, or not even our devs, unless the devs come up with some new crazy ideas that need more time working, then governance might be, get a bit pushed. But uh, we want to have fully on-chain governance here. Yeah. What are the plans? And maybe it's not up to you. Obviously, you, you're striving towards like a decentralized ownership of the protocol. But what do you expect to be the main value accrual for the gear token uh, over the longer term? Uh, different aspects could be done. Actually, while we are on it, uh, our con- uh, one of the contributors um, plays one in the COVID token terminal on the, that topic. So that could be interesting. Actually, crop that one out because that is like another source, right? So anyway, uh, the point is Gear Token, Gear DAO owns the entire thing. And it even voted to establish a foundation offshore so that the foundation on behalf of the Gear DAO could own the IP licenses and stuff like that. In this case, DAO even though there is no revenue sharing now, it could do it because the revenues are all assembled in the protocol. So that's the good part about it. Uh, What token model? The discussions have started. There are different ones. The thing is that token models, the really ones that stand out is the V-curve model, right? All the other ones are more just like, oh, buy back and burn. I wouldn't call it a token model. It's just like, it's, it's fine. Like you have some revenue, you burn. It's okay. But it's not a token token model. V at least has some loop, right? It doesn't mean we are very much fans of V, but it could be plugged in that it would make sense in a good way. But also we're not really rushing it because we need to see how the next stage of the, the product that's coming likely, I don't know, whenever devs make it, I, I have no fucking control over it. Uh, then after that, we could see what token model would make most sense and be most complementary. Yeah. yeah, V models are definitely interesting uh, to protocols that really need to focus on attracting liquidity. So I could see how that could be a fit, but I kind of like your approach of being cautious about that, right? Because there are, uh, it's not necessarily an easy token model to implement. Even like Balancer, who seems to have pulled it off now, uh, just a couple months ago, had a huge issue with like a whale, the uh, the Humpty situation, for those familiar. They were kind of compete, out-competing Balancer, or excuse me, Aura, their, uh, their convex style yield aggregator. Uh, so it's like, it's, it is interesting, but it's not necessarily just like a plug and play token strategy. Um, so if you think about like, you know, protocol revenue, the, the DAO uh, generates fees in three different ways. And I think they've generated about a half million fees uh, since inception. And would you ever consider things like revenue share or does it make more sense to kind of internalize that revenue and uh, help continue and bootstrap the growth of the protocol? Great question. I think there is always a thin line, right? Like we, of course, don't have any control over this thing since the first day, but Obviously, everybody wants to have some sort of revenue sharing, right? Or some sort of more genuine utility to it. Although A16Z can buy a fuckload of tokens one day to just vote a lot, right? As they do, which is fine. It's a good utility to have. Uh, not not even a joke anymore, right? It worked. So, uh, but yeah, so some token of some revenue sharing could be cool. The thing about revenues is that now Gearbox has two ways. Is One is the uh, liquidation fee and one is the APY spread fee on the land borrow. That doesn't mean these are all the fees that could exist. More could exist, just that they're not being done now. And that is what we see with many protocols is when the total market is like, what What did it shrink to? Is it 100 billion or even less at this point? It's less, right? Total DeFi market. Like how much are you even going to make money on that? Or if you split all of that revenue that you can make over all protocols, it's like tiny. So there isn't much point to try to make revenue right now because the market is so tiny. So you have to grow first and then you can do the revenue. It's a, it's a very easy reply, right? Because it's like, yeah, you can't argue with it, but also kind of true. Um, so yeah, a revenue model at some point would be cool. Uh, I guess the question of whether internalize it or not, um, I think it's just in line, right? At that point, I guess there would be arguments from like actual shareholders and versus stakeholders. That is what you see with Maker as well, where there was huge spending in the last year. So like they were doing well, but they also spent a lot, a lot. And it could be argued whether like even at least 30% of that was even well spent. Uh, so yeah, it, it depends. I guess it's somewhat of an issue where enough stakeholders are also shareholders at the same time. 
but why not? Like if they somehow manage to get the vote in power, that's how it works here. Yeah. So we'll see. We'll see. Do you guys have anything else you want to hit real quick before we uh, hop off? Sure. What kind of strategy? Are you farming yourself now? Myself right now? No, Dan. Yeah, I've been farming the shit out of uh, Frax ETH ETH, uh, that, the uh, convex pool there, just because the strategies that Frax is employing to kind of spin that flywheel is really intriguing. Uh, so yeah, I went balls deep and did the one year lock on that pool. Solid, solid. Big balls. Nice, nice. Okay, noted. Yeah, no, and I'm curious, like... Obviously, like the Frax token, the stablecoin is specifically, um, you know, that's kind of like been touted as a, like a farming token, really. It's not somewhere you go to stable for long terms of periods of time. Like that's really just USDC at this point. Um, you could argue Tether as well. Um, and, and I feel like Dai is kind of getting there. You know, Sam Kazimian really talks about like the monetary premium behind stablecoins and like why uh, like users would want to hold them, like spot creating spot demand for the token. Um, and even in like DAO treasuries as well, right? Like you do see some DAOs holding DAI now. Um, and so that's kind of like why I think their view of creating Frax ETH uh, as like, the, you know, kind of separating out the yield generating asset from the base underlying asset is pretty exciting. Um, and so, yeah, it makes a great farming opportunity, at least for the near term. All right. Well, hey, guys, thanks so much for coming on. We'll have to do another update and bring you guys back uh, in like four to six months once uh, some more stuff happens in Gearbox. But again, thank you. If you guys want to tell the, the audience where they can find you. Uh, hopefully not in jail, but otherwise at gearbox.5. Discord, Twitter, anywhere. 24-7 online, yeah. Sadly, no life. <laughs> All right. Sounds pretty similar to us. Well, th thanks again, guys. We'll, uh, we'll catch you again soon.